key design question that we ask ourselves is whether or not the structures we design can safely carry the design loads for a given design lifetime. This is why we talked about various failure criteria. So far, we've talked about uniaxial yield. That's simple. When we have a simple uniaxial stress state, we can compare the load to the uniaxial stress, and we can say that the allowable load in uniaxial stress is this just the uniaxial yield strength divided by a design factor of safety. We also talked about buckling, and we tried to design our structures so that they would not experience elastic buckling. But we also considered in those structures whether or not they would yield. So we have to ask ourselves, is it buckling failure or yield failure? So that's a key question. Then we talked about multi-axial loading. And in multi-axial loading, we are trying to convert to an equivalent uniaxial case. That is the entire basis of the von Mises yield criteria and something you've seen a lot in all of the FEA that we've done over this quarter. So now we're interested in fracture. If we're looking at materials fracturing, then what we are doing is we're calculating a stress intensity factor. We're gonna stick with a mode one stress intensity factor. And we are going to compare K1 to K1C, which is the mode one fracture toughness. The mode one fracture toughness is a material property, and the stress intensity factor is simply the stress times the square root of pi A, and we're gonna set that equal to a K1C. But there's another factor that we have to add here, and that is there's gonna be a factor out front, which we call beta. It is a geometric correction factor. And this geometric correction factor arises out of the fact that we will have finite plates of finite dimensions. And it may turn out that our defects in our samples, the width of our plates would be finite. And our defects, if they're fully embedded within the plate, are going to be of length 2a, but they can be off-center. And that's going to affect the stress intensity factor. We would get some beta for that. Well, what if we have a sample that's of width W and it has an edge crack of length A? And these things are loaded in tension. So we're looking at mode one opening stress intensity factors. We're going to get a different beta for that. What if we have a sample of width W and it has edge cracks on each side of depth A? Well, we're going to get different betas for that. So we have to look up the beta to properly calculate the stress intensity factor before we compare it to the fracture toughness for that given material. So that's an important extra step that you must take. Now, it's uh, also important to think about the form of this stress intensity factor. So we know this. We know that if you did a bunch of experiments that you could measure the mode one fracture toughness and it would be related to beta times the stress you apply times the square root of the defect size. And then we could plot stress as a function of defect size. And what we would find is a curve that looked like this. That curve is going to be equal to K1C divided by beta root pi A. It falls off according to this power law relationship. And given a fracture toughness of a material and a flaw size, if you keep the stress below the line, so this is safe operation down here, and up here would be fracture. But we have some other things that we have to consider. We got to think about the possibility of yield as well. So we do have to overlay on top of this curve the yield strength, and it behooves us to look at where the yield line intersects the fracture line. Everything below the yield in the fracture line would be safe. Everything above it would fail. But it means we're going to have some defect sizes where yield controls failure and some defect sizes where fracture is going to control failure. So we have to sort this out in order to understand whether or not we have yield or fracture. So we're going to identify a defect that is associated with a stress level equal to the yield strength. Now, I'm also going to assume, just for the sake of simplicity and derivations, I'm gonna let beta equal to one. And I'm gonna solve for this crack size where to the right of that crack size, failure would be governed by fracture. To the left of that crack size, failure would be governed 
by yield. I am going to then take this equation where K1C is going to be equal to the stress. Remember, beta is equal to 1. I'm going to let the stress be equal to the yield strength. I'm going to multiply that by pi A. That A is now my A0. I solve for A0, and I get K1C squared over SY squared 1 over pi. That becomes an A0 value. And so if we have a structure and we know the fracture toughness of the material from which it's made, and we know the defect size that we're curious about, and we also know the yield strength of that material, then if our defect A is greater than A0, failure is governed by fracture. If A is less than A0, then failure is going to be governed by yield. So this is important because it allows you to figure out whether or not you have a fracture problem or a yield problem. And it's the first thing you should look at whenever you're solving problems out there. The best way to understand how to deal with this is to do an example problem. We're going to do example 5-7 out of the book where we have a plate that is 1.4 meters in width, 2.8 meters long. It is loaded in tension along the long direction with a load of four mega newtons. And we don't know the thickness of the plate. That's what we're supposed to decide. And we are supposed to make that decision by comparing two titanium alloys, which are right up here, that have different heat treatments. In one case, we have a yield strength of 1,000 and 35 MPa with a fracture toughness of 55 megapascal square root meters. In the other case, we have a yield strength of 910 MPa and a fracture toughness of 115 megapascal square root meters. So the way we deal with this sort of problem is we have to decide when we're making a choice whether or not it is yield or fracture dominated. Now, we have another thing in here, and that is that there is a, an inspection method that can identify edge cracks that have a depth A of 2.7 millimeters. So that's the resolution limit. So we're going to use that as our defect size, and we're going to decide whether or not we have yield or fracture in each of these two alloys, alloy one and alloy two up here, and then make a decision about what the dimensions would be. The other thing that the problem is asking for is which alloy would give you the lightest weight material. Now they're both titanium alloys, so they're gonna have the same density. They just have different heat treatments, which changes the yield strength and the fracture toughness. And so the thinner alloy will be lighter. If we have yield, failure, then the allowable stress, which is just my applied load divided by my cross-sectional area, is going to be my yield strength div divided by the design factor of safety. In this case, the design factor of safety, N, is 1.3. If we have fracture, the allowable stress intensity is going to be the fracture toughness, K1C, divided by the design factor of safety. So in alloy 1, we see that we have these properties. In alloy 2, we have these properties. So we're going to go ahead and assume that beta is equal to 1. If you work it out, beta is 1.1. It's not going to change the answer all that much. So to make life simple in this calculation, I'll just assume beta is equal to 1. And I'm going to go ahead and solve for my transition defect size, which we've already shown you is 1 over pi times the ratio of the fracture toughness to the yield strength squared. For alloy 1, the fracture toughness is 115 megapascal square root meters, for, and the yield strength is 910 megapascals. We solve for our transition defect size, and it gives us 5 millimeters. For alloy 2, we have 55 megapascal square root meter toughness and 1035 MPa yield strength, which gives me a transition defect size of 0.9 millimeters. Now, my measurable defect size is 2.7. So you can see that in case 1, the defect size of 2.7 is less than, so 2.7 is less than 5 millimeters. And so we have yield dominated behavior in that case. So we're going to design based upon SY. And in case two, our defect size 2.7 millimeters is greater than the 0.9 millimeter transition defect size. So this is a fracture dominated problem. So what we do then is under the yield dominated scenario, we say that our stress which is our load divided by cross-sectional area. Well, what is our cross-sectional area? In this case, our cross-sectional area is going to be the thickness 
multiplied by 1.4 meters. So this tells me that P over T times 1.4 meters has got to be equal to the yield strength divided by 1.3. So that's 910 megapascals divided by 1.3. My P was 4 meganewtons, give me a sample thickness of 4 millimeters. In case two, we are fracture dominated. And so what we do is we compare our stress intensity factor to our fracture toughness knocked down by the design factor. Well, that's just 55 megapascal square root meters. I can see I left the square root meters off there. Divided by 1.3. And my K1s is just sigma root pi a. That's going to be equal to this 55 over 1.3 megapascal square root meters. My a is going to be my defect size, which is 2.7 times 10 to the minus third meters. And my stress is just going to be p over a. That's going to be p over w times t. That's going, and I multiply that by pi times 2.7 times 10 to the minus third meters. It is equal to 55 over 1.3 megapascal square root meters. You have to be careful about the units when you're doing this. You solve for T, P equal four meganewtons, and W equal 1.4 meters. That gives me a plate thickness in this case of 6.22 millimeters. So case two requires a thicker plate than does case one. So we will choose the material from case one, which will be a yield dominated failure, and it gives me a plate thickness of four millimeters.